Uh, Welcome to this third Sunday of Advent as we draw closer and closer to the celebration of Christmas. Uh, And as we've done the first few weeks of Advent, uh, one of the things we'll do as we begin this morning to mark uh, those weeks that have gone by uh, is the lighting of our Advent wreath. And so as we light these candles, we are reminded of Jesus' words when he told his disciples, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ. And we're reminded in Isaiah 49, the Lord said to his servant, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Come, Lord Jesus, our light and our salvation. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. I'll pray and we'll jump in. Father, thank you for this morning and our time together. God, as we spend time this morning thinking about joy and the joy that we can have in you, I pray that you would renew us and restore us, that we would be reminded of what you've done for us, of the hope that we have in you, and that, God, we would leave this morning and leave your word with the joyful spirit renewed in the good news of what you've done for us. Father, we love you. We ask this all in your son's name. Amen. All right, well, as we get into Isaiah 35 this morning, I just want to start with the question, and that question is this, as you think back on your life, when are those moments when you've experienced the most joy? You probably have a handful of moments that you can think of when you were just overcome with this sense of excitement, of joy, of happiness. I've got a few, and one of these I only remember because there's some unfortunate video evidence, but there was a Christmas morning as a small child when uh, there's a video of me waking up on Christmas morning and running to the Christmas tree and opening just a few months after it had come out, the first Super Nintendo I ever owned. And on this video, there's a lot of jumping, there's a lot of screaming, there's a lot of yelling things in a thick Kentucky accent that does not need to see the light of day, and it's taken me many years to work that out of my system, but it's there. There's a handful of other moments, standing in front of my friends and family in a church, and down the aisle, the doors open, and I see my wife in her wedding dress for the first time. I'm filled with joy. The moment that the doctor handed me my uh, kids, the moments after they were first born, it's hard to express the joy you feel in a moment like that. You probably have a handful of those moments for you. And now while I can think of specific moments where I've experienced joy, I don't know that people would necessarily call me a joyful person. And maybe some of you are naturally joyful, but I don't actually think that describes a lot of people or I'm just hanging out with the wrong people. But I don't think most people would say they have a constant sense of of joy in their life, and yet we're people who long to experience joy. Many of us are chasing joy in this life. We're looking for those moments. We're looking for those times where we can be, again, overcome with a sense of awe, a sense of excitement, a sense of happiness, and yet for many of us, those moments of joy are fleeting. We don't experience joy as often as we would like in this life. And maybe that's just because joy comes in a moment and then it's gone, and there are a handful of moments when we'll feel it, but it's not meant to be this uh, constant feeling that we have in our lives, or maybe we're just looking for joy in the wrong place. Now, not every moment of your life can be this mountaintop, uh, you know, over-the-moon happy experience, but I think it is possible to live with this underlying current of joy in our lives. And thankfully, Isaiah 35 opens up to us where we can find this never-ending source of joy. Isaiah 35, verses 1 and 2. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Again, if you missed the last couple of weeks, Isaiah's writing to a group of people who are anything but joyful. In fact, they're pretty fearful as Isaiah writes these words. 
We've mentioned several times there's this looming prospect of the Assyrians coming into Israel and conquering the people and driving them out of the land. And in their fear, the Israelites are considering turning to an unexpected place for help. In chapters 28 through 33 of Isaiah, the prophet pleads with the people because the thought they're having is, maybe we should go to the Egyptians and ask them for help. Now, I don't know what you know about the story of Israel and the Egyptians in the Old Testament, but this is an unexpected place for the people of God to turn to ask for protection. And Isaiah is pleading with them, God has said he will protect you. If you will worship him, if you'll remain faithful, he has promised to keep you safe in the land. But when people are afraid, they do irrational things. And when people are fearful, they make decisions they wouldn't normally make. And eventually the Israelites do go to the Egyptians and ask for their protection. And it turns out poorly as Isaiah promised that it would. Again, at the beginning of Isaiah 35, verses 1 and 2, the people of God find themselves in this place where they're afraid. God feels distant. They're struggling to trust his promises. They're in this place where all of their circumstances are making it difficult for them to trust God. And this imagery of being in the desert, of being in the wilderness, is imagery that the Bible uses often, not just to describe Israel's condition in Isaiah 35, but really to describe the plight of humanity throughout history. That if you're paying attention as you read the Bible, there's this common pattern that shows up over and over again, and it's this. God's people find themselves in a place where they need to be rescued, and eventually God does rescue his people, and on the other side of that salvation, the people of God experience this overwhelming joy. We see it first in the book of Exodus as the people of God are in slavery in Egypt, and God delivers them and brings them across the Red Sea and leads them to the promised land, and as they're delivered from their slavery, we see Moses and the people singing. They're overcome with joy. In the book of Isaiah, the people are eventually conquered and driven out of the promised land. But Isaiah gives them this hope that a day is coming when God will restore you and he'll bring you back into the land out of exile. And when that happens, the people experience the joy of the salvation of the Lord. And so we see this pattern of deliverance needed and then God providing deliverance and the joy that comes from that. And what we come to discover in the New Testament is this, is that that story of Israel that's told over and over again in the Old Testament is actually our story as well. We too find ourselves in the wilderness. We too find ourselves in slavery as the people of God were in Egypt. Only this time it's not to the Egyptians, it's to Sin, we're told in the New Testament, and we're enslaved to sin to the degree that on our own we cannot please God because there's this natural bent in our hearts away from God. That is, the people of God lived in exile in the Old Testament. We discover that all of humanity, in a sense, is living in exile, away from their home, that we were made to live in the presence of God, and yet because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God, we were separated from Him and driven from the presence of God. And so just as the people of God needed to receive their freedom in Exodus, just as the people of God needed to be brought back into their homeland in the book of Isaiah and throughout the prophets, so too all of humanity finds itself in this wilderness where we're enslaved to sin, where we're far from the presence of God. And in order for us to be made right with God again, God will have to deliver us as he delivered Israel over and over again in the Old Testament. Left to ourselves, we are spiritually in the wilderness that Isaiah describes here in Isaiah 35.1. Far from God, struggling to trust his promises, and this is the root of our problem as human beings. Again, maybe you haven't been able to put your finger on it before, but, but this is some of what you're feeling in this life, that deep in your soul there's this nagging, maybe emptiness, maybe dryness, maybe a lifelessness that you've spent your entire life trying to, to fix or overcome. There's this search for joy in the human heart. 
And that's a good desire that we have because we were made for joy, but the problem is we often turn to the wrong places to try and satisfy that desire for joy in our lives. That the story of the Bible is this, is that we were made for God, and in the presence of God, there is joy. When we live with God, we experience that joy that we're longing for. And yet, because of what sin has done to our hearts and minds, we often look everywhere but the presence of God to experience this joy. Pastor Tim Keller puts it this way when he writes, Do you remember when your mother used to say to you, don't eat candy before meals? Why did she say that? Because she knew it would ruin your next meal. The trouble with eating candy is that it gives you a sugar buzz and then you don't feel hungry. Candy masks the fact that your body needs proteins and vitamins. The sugar buzz from candy masks your hunger for the real things you don't have. He says things like sex and power and money and success, as well as favorable circumstances, act like spiritual sugar. Christians who have these candies may say, I believe in God and I know I'm going to heaven, but they're actually basing their day-to-day joy on favorable circumstances. When the circumstances change, it drives us to God because when the sugar disappears, when the candy gets taken away, we're forced to pursue the feast that our souls really crave. We'll hunger for the spiritual nutrients we really need. Again, so many of us are seeking to satisfy the longings of our soul with the things that he mentions here, success and power and money and sex. And then we get those things, and what do we discover? They do not satisfy us like we thought they would. And so the question we're left with is this, we were made for joy. We were made to experience joy because we were made in the image of God, and God is the most joyful being in existence. And yet, in our desire for joy, we often don't know where to turn to find it. But Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 35 where we can find true and deep and lasting joy. Again, verses 1 and 2, he gives this promise that the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. And then he paints this vivid picture of the desert becoming this lush garden. And he says at the end of the verse 2, this will happen when they see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. Again, it's life in the presence of God that restores and renews the desert. It's life in the presence of God that renews this barren and dead place that Isaiah describes here, that in this vision, this desert becomes one of the most beautiful places on earth, and it's transformed into this incredible place where there is life everywhere, and this happens because the presence of God is in this place once again again. And what Isaiah is holding out for us is this idea that it's in beholding the beauty and the goodness and the truthfulness of God that the driest desert can be transformed into the most beautiful garden. And not just this earth, but our hearts and souls as well. The picture that Isaiah is painting here is not just a picture of a renewed creation. Isaiah is using this vivid imagery to describe what must happen within each of us. That just as this wilderness is barren, is desert, is lifeless, that left to ourselves in our hearts and in our minds, we experience this wilderness, we experience this desert, and we're hungry to experience new life. That is what our deepest longing is for. But how does this happen? How do we experience God in such a way that we are renewed and made new? We're told in verses 3 and 4, strengthen the weak knees and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. And the promise held out for Israel in Isaiah 35 is the promise held out for all of us that we are people in need of rescuing, and it's not a rescue effort that we're going to be be able to pull off ourselves. Rather, we're going to need God to come and save us. We're going to need God to come and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Again, we discover in the pages of Scripture that we were made for life with God, and yet the problem that Scripture presents us with is this. We cannot work our way back into the presence of God. We cannot 
earn our way into God's presence through our good deeds. We can't deserve to be in the presence of God through the good and moral things that we do. Rather, in order for us to be back in the presence of God and to find the joy and the happiness that we long for, we're going to need God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Because part of what the Apostle Paul helps us see in his letters is this. We were made for life with God, and yet part of the insidiousness of sin is that it has so warped our hearts and minds that the very thing we need to experience life and joy and happiness, a relationship with God, is something that we naturally resist. That there's something that can heal our our bodies, that can heal our souls, that, that God holds out the prospect of life to us, and yet what we come to discover is the very thing that can heal us, the very thing that can transform us from this barren desert into this fruitful creation is the thing we refuse to believe, the thing we refuse to accept because our sin has given us this bent away from God, where we keep him at arm's length, where we resist the truthful of who he is. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural person, the person just left to themselves, their own intellect, their own will, their own desires, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. And what Paul sets up for us here is this idea that part of the reason our souls feel so dry and so empty, again, is that the very thing we were meant to experience in this life, life with God, is not something we can work our way to on our own. That in in many ways, our experience in this world is like we're wandering around in the dark, grasping for God, whether or not we realize it. And yet Paul tells us here, without God's intervention, without the help of God, God is something we'll never take hold of because there's something inside of us in our rebellion against God that resists his help, that resists wanting to be in his presence. That again, the very thing that could heal us, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, seems foolish to us. And so unless God does a work in us, helping us see what we can't see and believe what we can't believe, we will not turn back to the presence of God. And yet, here is the promise of Isaiah 35, 5 to 7. God not only comes to us to rescue us, but in rescuing us, he works a transformation in us that we can't make possible on our own. Isaiah goes on to say, then when God comes to his people, the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. What happens when God comes to rescue his people? Isaiah tells us that when God comes, we will be healed, that when God comes, it's like water breaking forth in the midst of dry ground. It's like this desert being transformed into the most beautiful garden. And again, what Isaiah is describing is not just the earth being renewed. This is a picture of the human heart and the human soul as God comes to us. We are spiritually dead. We're spiritually dry. We're unable to see the truthfulness of who Jesus is. And then Isaiah says, but God comes to us and takes away our blindness so we can see what we couldn't see before. And he unstops our ears so we can hear and believe the the truthfulness that we couldn't believe before. And in many ways, God comes to us and gives us spiritual life we could not conjure up on our own. That it is possible to be renewed. It is possible to be made new and experience spiritual life in the presence of God. But it's not possible unless God does a supernatural work in us. I say this a couple times a year, but it's something we should honestly be reminded of every single day. If you're here this morning and you love Jesus... If you have any ounce of belief in Jesus in your body, 
That's not something you came up with on your own. That's not because you heard persuasive arguments from the, for the gospel and it seemed reasonable to you and so your intellect teased out the truthfulness of who God is. You didn't decide to follow Jesus because you're just more naturally a more moral person or a more spiritual person than the people around you. If you have faith in Christ... It is because God worked a supernatural miracle in your heart and mind, giving you new life that you didn't have before, giving you the ability to see and to believe and to taste what you had no appetite for before. I think this is most clearly expressed by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2, 1 to 6, when he describes what God has done for those who believe. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. As we all know, dead people can't bring themselves back to life. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul's saying because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God, we deserve the judgment of God. If God was fair, he would have poured out his wrath on all of humanity, Paul says. But then in verse 4, in one of the most important verses in all of Scripture, he reminds us, but God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Again, if you're here this morning and you believe God is the one who raised you up, God is the one who's given you spiritual life. And it's only through God coming to us in the person of Jesus that we had any hope of finding that joy that we're desperately searching for. There may be plenty of reasons for you to not have joy as you sit here this morning. Maybe the circumstances of your life aren't what you want them to be. Maybe you haven't been able to accomplish all that you've wanted to accomplish by this point in your life. Maybe you finally did get your hands on what you most wanted in this life, and you're living in this weird place right now where you've realized it didn't do for you what you thought it would. That relationship, that accomplishment, that number in your bank account didn't satisfy this longing in your heart. And what we're reminded of in Isaiah 35 is this, is that even when, and especially when, we can find joy nowhere else, we can find joy in this. And God has come for us that God has saved us, and that even when we did not deserve it, God did everything necessary to make it possible for us to come back to God. And even in our darkest night, that's a source of joy that we can hang on to. And the question is, but how do we, God's made it possible, but how do we get back to God? Verse 8, and a highway shall be there, And it shall be called the way of holiness. He's saying, as the people are in the desert wandering around, God will build a highway, a path straight to him. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Again, look at the promise of verse 8. We are those who on our own are wandering around seeking for God. And Isaiah says, but God has come to us and he has made a highway straight into his presence. He has set a straight path before us back into life with him. And a little later, several hundred years after Isaiah made this promise, we discovered what that highway was. As Jesus sits with his disciples before he's about to die and says to them in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And what we discover about this promised highway that God would build to him is this, is that Jesus is that way back to God. 
Jesus is that path that we walk. And part of the reason we needed Jesus to come to this earth, part of the reason we celebrate Jesus' first coming as we do this time of year is because it was in that coming of Jesus that we discovered it is possible to get back to God. That as we follow Christ, we are able to follow Jesus back into the presence of God because Jesus is the one who could do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Jesus is the one who succeeded where we failed. That as we were called to live perfectly obedient lives to God, we failed. That as our ancestors were called to live perfectly obedient lives to God, Adam and Eve, the first human beings, they failed. And yet Jesus comes and he lives a life of perfect obedience, perfect faithfulness to the will of God. And where we failed, he succeeded. And not only that, if we will put our hope and trust in him, that righteousness that he earned, that perfect life that he lived, he gives us credit for that and covers us in his righteousness so that God can look at us now, if our faith is in Jesus, and say incredible things about us like you are saints and you are holy and you are righteous. And we know it's not true, but it's true because if we are in Christ, he has earned that for us. And not only did Jesus live the life we couldn't live, he died the death we deserve to die. That as Paul says in Ephesians 2, we were by nature children of wrath, deserving the judgment of God. Jesus took that judgment on himself on the cross taking our guilt, taking our sin and our rebellion and our shame on himself, dying in our place as our substitute. And when we see Jesus on the cross, we are seeing what we should have experienced at the end of this life if God was fair, if God gave us what we deserved. But Jesus goes and pays back the debt to God that you and I owed. He takes that judgment on himself and raises from the dead to declare to all of humanity that payment has been made in full, that God has received that sacrifice and that there is life for us, not only on this earth, but beyond the grave, life in the presence of God. And it's in following Jesus on this highway we find what we're longing for. And then Isaiah closes with these words to remind us, and these are those who will be able to walk this path back into the presence of God. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Again, we were made for life with God, but we've been separated from him, and yet it's possible for us to find our way back to God, not in our own strength, not through the works of our hands or our feeble knees, as Isaiah says here in chapter 35, but Isaiah says, no, it is the ransomed who are able to walk that path, not the spiritually mature, not the moral, not the any other descriptor. It's the ransomed who can walk that path. This idea of redemption is central to the storyline of the Bible, and you find it in several ways in the Old Testament. For example, a redeemer or someone who provided redemption for another person might be someone who paid a price to to purchase the freedom of a slave in the Old Testament. Or a redeemer might be someone who comes to a family member and has a great debt and takes that debt on themselves and pays the debt themselves to earn the freedom from that obligation for their family member. And in saying that it's the ransomed who will be able to walk this path into the presence of God, we're being reminded in Isaiah that Jesus is the one who would be our redeemer, who took our debt on himself, who paid the price we couldn't afford to pay, and in a very real way, purchased our spiritual freedom so that we could return to God in forgiveness and in love solely out of his mercy and grace for us. And it's when we realize that fact that Jesus loved us enough to pay a price for us to come back to God that that we could not pay on our own, that hopefully that joy begins to well up within us. The Apostle Peter says this is what happened to him because as he writes in 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and you rejoice with the joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 
that Peter writes, when you understand that you have been saved, that you were destined for hell and now you're destined for heaven, that you were spiritually dead and now you have spiritual life, that you were separated from the presence of God and now you experience life in his presence fully all of the time as his Holy Spirit dwells in you, there is inexpressible joy in that fact that should well up within us. And again, this can be a difficult world to live in, and it's okay to admit that there are seasons that are hard where we feel pain and where we suffer and where we experience anguish. But in the midst of those seasons, may we never forget that just as Israel walked through the Red Sea and rejoiced, and just as Israel was led back to the promised land after exile and rejoiced, our spiritually dead hearts and minds have been given new life by God himself. And for that reason, we can rejoice even when everything else about our circumstances is telling us that there's no joy to be found. In his book, Deserted by God, author and pastor Sinclair Ferguson shares the following story. He writes, the first physician to die of the AIDS virus in the United Kingdom was a young Christian. He had contracted it while doing medical research in Zimbabwe. And in the last days of his life, his power of communication failed. He struggled with increasing difficulty to express his thoughts to his wife. And on one occasion, one occasion, she simply could not understand what he was trying to say. He simply wrote on a notepad the letter J. She ran through her medical dictionary saying various words beginning with J, and none of them were right. And she finally asked him, do you mean Jesus? That was the right word. He was with them. That was all either of them needed to know. And for both of them, it was always enough. Do you know that Jesus is enough this morning? Are you experiencing that in life right now? Do you know he is the very thing that you've been searching for? Do you know that life with God, which is available to you, is the only thing that's going to satisfy the longings of your heart? And as you do experience joy in this life, in those moments where we find them, and we should find them in those kind of moments we described at the beginning of the sermon, that the joy you experience in relationships and moments here on earth are actually pointing you to a greater and a deeper joy. One author puts it this way, the world and its history are prelude and foretaste. All the sunrises and sunsets, symphonies and rock concerts, feasts and friendships are but whispers. They're a prologue to the grander story of an even better place, only there it will never end. Theologian J.I. Packer said it well, hearts on earth say in the course of a joyful experience, I don't ever want this to end, but invariably it does. The heart in heaven says, I want this to go on forever, and it will. And there can be no better news than this. As we get ready to sing this morning, And we ask, where do we go from here? Maybe for some of you, you have been looking for something, and this is the first time that you've heard that God has done everything necessary for you to come into his presence to be made right with him. He's not waiting for you to clean yourself up. He's not waiting for you to do enough spiritual things to accept you. He's waiting for you to trust Jesus, to believe that he died the death you deserve to die, to believe that he lived the life you could never live, And if you're willing to trust in him and follow him, you could leave this morning knowing you're forgiven of your sins, you're right with God, you've been adopted into the family of God, and find a source of joy in that fact that you will find nowhere else in this life. For some of us, maybe, again, there aren't a lot of reasons for joy this morning, and you just needed to be reminded of the fact today that even when it feels like everything else has fallen apart, don't miss what Jesus has done for you and continues to do for you to make you right with God. That's a reason to have joy even in the midst of our darkest seasons. And as our church, my prayer for us is this, that in a world that is not filled with joyful people and where joyful people are hard to find, that Lafayette and Purdue and West Lafayette might know City of God and might know City of God as the joyful people in our city.
Because we have a reason for joy that the world knows nothing about, and we have a reason for joy to offer to those around us if we will be faithful to God and take that message wherever we go.